So let us start with the part on linguistics. Uh, first of all, because uh, for most of you, it was uh, the newest part, something you have uh, discovered, most of you, and also because it's necessary to understand the other two parts. Okay. Uh, so what is important is to realize these uh, strata we have on, on slide six and um, to be able to uh, locate the level on which you will work, depending on your problem. And most of the time you will deal with more than one levels and obviously they interact. So uh, in uh, text mining, we very often, if not always start with a corpus, the corpus of our problem. And we process this corpus. And of course, if it's computer data, then it's text or voice. And then we have to deal with the lowest level if it's text, it will be graphemics. If it's voice, it will be phonetics and phonology. And once we have processed this level, we have to move to morphology, to syntax. And sometimes a lower level will depend on a higher level. So this isn't, this doesn't happen all the time, but in some cases you have ambiguity. So you have to go up and down again and so on. Tools are different. We will see the many tools uh, used for different levels. Uh, formalisms are different. And uh, one of the main challenges of doing text mining and natural language processing is to know which strata you need to uh, deal with and uh, what tools to apply. Okay, so it's really important to know what each level here represents. Now, I'm starting with the lowest level because uh, it's, uh, it's natural. I have some slides on phonetics and phonology. What is important here is to realize the difference of approach. So in, in phonetics, we say that we have a physical phenomenon, which is sound, and not just any sound, sound produced by human organs like these. And to study it, we decompose it into different components. And among these components, you have F1 and F2, uh, which are called formants and are harmonics of the fundamental frequency. So this is something that can be represented in a scientific way uh, that can be measured. And if you combine these two measures, then you get a discriminative figure involving things that you learn in school, in grammar, things that are called vowels, vowels of your language, of your spoken language. Now, of course, in school, you don't learn all of these. You will learn some of them and others are implicit. If you are a speaker of a given language, you will recognize some of them and discover some others. So for example, I don't think every French man knows that uh, E in je and E in oeuf is not the same. This is something you discover when you dig a bit. But uh, what is interesting here is that by using these two physical um, units that are F1 and F2, you can distinguish 
sounds that correspond to vowels. Now, this is the first fact, and here are the different ways of distinguishing sounds emitted by humans. These are called phones. And, uh, well, it's very scientific. You have properties, and these are binary, and uh, they allow distinguishing between these phones. And then the other thing that is very important is to understand the difference between phones and phonemes, which is the same as between graphs and graphemes. So this is an idea that started with the structuralist movement. It's the idea of saying, I'm building classes of things but these classes are not based on intrinsic properties of these things. These classes are based on differences. So whenever I can distinguish two things, then I say that they belong to a different class. So being in a class is not because one shares a common property. It's because one is distinguished from members of other classes. So once you understood this, you got the difference between phones and phonemes. So phonemes are classes of phones that are distinguished in a given language. And this is why phones are the same for all humans because they are just depending on the human organs of speech and we all have the same organs. While phonemes are different for each language because each language has a different way of distinguishing between uh, classes of phones. And here the slide is saying that sometimes we will put in the same phoneme sounds that are represented by different phones. So this is not just a difference between you and me, between two speakers of the same language. This is not something unique for each human. It's really the fact that some words have systematically different phones, but are still considered as belong to the same phony. Okay. Uh, this is just for information for you to know that people have worked on how we go from phones to phonemes and how we formalize this. Then the next step is building syllables. Syllables have an onset which uh, uh, in French is called attack. Sorry, here's a, a Latin problem here. And uh, a rhyme, and a rhyme has a nucleus and a coda. So this is a standard way of describing syllables. Some languages have tones. And uh, we can measure also other uh, quantities like duration, intensity, intonation. And this is important when you deal with voice. So if someday you uh, are working on, on systems based on speech, then these will be your daily bread. Because it's with prosody that we can detect uh, feeling, sentiment, emotion, intention. And these are the tools we use. And here is a nice table showing how you can detect emotions by physical properties. And it's on the same, sim, uh, the same principle of distinguishing things by having different properties. What happens in voice also happens in a written text. 
I spent some time on uh, graphetics and graphemics because it's um, my uh, personal domain of interest. So maybe I've spent more the time than others would on this subject. But again, don't forget that uh, the web contains mostly text. And even if it has other sources like uh, on YouTube, you have videos, even then uh, YouTube has automatic uh, algorithms for detecting and representing voice in the videos. So even if you have other resources than text, there is still an ongoing effort on extracting text from these resources. So basically, text is the most widespread resource on the web. So text is important and uh, has to be dealt with. No, here this slide is just to let you know that um, uh, text is kind of a black sheep for linguists because Saussure in 1916 said that uh, linguists should only study speech and text is an epiphenomenon. It's something uh, secondary and um, therefore for the whole 20th century, uh, there's been very little studies on text and a lot of studies on speech. Okay, so this is just for your encyclopedic knowledge. And of course, uh, this example is uh, new. It's typically 21st century. And it shows that communication can sometimes exceed oral, uh, the oral modality. And uh, there will be more and more of this. And uh, you will witness more and more attempts of uh, going beyond uh, spoken language. Uh, these are the different modes. Uh, this is just to say that uh, you shouldn't think of writing systems as being monolithic. Every writing system can use all of these modes. And so, for example, in French, when you write cassette, and this is sad because the inventor of cassettes died um, a few days ago. So when you're uh, at the age of 94, so when you say, uh, when you write a K and a seven to mean cassette, well, this is syllabic because you take the pronunciation set and K, the letter K, cassette. When you write this, this is pictographic. And when you write this phi in that way, in that specific way with that color, then it is logo logographic. It's the um, logo of the political party France Insoumise. So uh, what you uh, should keep from this slide is the fact that uh, writing systems can be used in many different ways. And if the text you're going to process is free text, for example, from social media, then you can expect all of this to happen in your corpus. And of course, you will have to deal with it. Then I have some slides on typography. So this is again, encyclopedic knowledge. Gender neutral writing, this is something that will uh, expand more and more. And uh, well, you should be aware of it. And the, the, the software will, you will write will also will have to be aware of it. For example, imagine you have software that um, will uh, convert written to spoken language. Uh, then here, you will have to deal with this. You will have to duplicate this in étudiante et étudiant. 
des étudiants attentifs et les étudiantes attentives, and so on. So, um, this has to be dealt with in a, a careful way. Uh, so, this is about typography. This is merely encyclopedic, but can give you ideas. Then I have uh, some slides about Chinese. So, of course, if you don't, uh, you, you will not uh, learn Chinese. I don't speak Chinese myself, but still you have to be aware of some facts about Chinese language to be able to process it uh, correctly whenever needed. Then uh, some slides on Unicode. Now here we are moving from linguistics to computing. Not necessarily computer science, but computing. And uh, this is also important to know because uh, you are using Unicode every day and your corpora will also very probably be in Unicode. So you should be aware of how it works what the principles are, the different layers. So what is really UTF-8 and what is it used for? So here you have the answer. And uh, how to deal with Unicode in uh, programming languages. So of course, the purpose of this slide is not to teach your given programming language, but to have you think about this fact that when you see Cyrillic here, it's not because there is Cyrillic in the text, there is no such thing. It's because in the file, you have specific codes that your text editor recognizes as being Cyrillic. So uh, we are used to the distinct as to, to the distinction between text editors and word processors. And we say, uh, when I say we, I mean programmers, hackers, and so on. We say that a word processor is lying, a word processor is adding things, uh, it, uh, it's embellishing things, it's hiding things while a text editor is frank, a text editor is honest, they're showing only what is contained in the file. Yes, that's true, but a text editor also goes through the operating system to display text and it will display bytes that belong to UTF-8 encoded characters as individual glyphs. So here the text editor is already intervening, interfering in representation and shows you what you want to see. It shows you Unicode characters, even though here, if you think about it, I have here one byte, one byte, two bytes. So I'm not seeing strictly what is in the file. I'm seeing a representation of it. And asking Python to put this U, even though it may not be necessary in the recent versions of Python, is saying you should look at this the same way I'm looking at it. And if I ask you how many characters are here, you should answer one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and not 19, since there are 19 bytes here. Okay, so that's the purpose of this slide. Now we move to morphology. 
uh, morphology deals with morphemes. Once again, you have something ending with eames. And eames in a structuralist approach are elementary units of study in some domain. Graphemes, morphemes, lexemes, uh, graphemes, phonemes, lexemes, graph uh, morphemes, semimes, and so on. Okay. Now, what are morphemes? Morphemes are elementary units of meaning. What is important here is to uh, understand this definition. What is an elementary unit of meaning? It's not philosophical. We're not talking about uh, meaning in general. We are talking about sequences of either phonemes or graphemes. And in these sequences, how can we segment them in order to obtain meaning and minimal in the sense that we cannot segment any further? So that's all. There is nothing very profound or philosophical about it. And this is why I started with this uh, strange slide. Here you have a sequence of graphemes that makes absolutely no sense. And progressively, I am approaching something that makes sense, at least in a language which you maybe do not speak, but you can trust me, it does make sense. And uh, this is how you should consider morphemes. Now, um, what is important is to distinguish free morphemes and bound morphemes. So in French, these will be morphème libre or morphème lexico, and this will be morphème grammatico. So in, in French, we call these grammatical. And it's important to distinguish them because the first ones are free and it's an open set. You can create new ones. And the second ones are a closed set because all speakers of a given language have to recognize them and use them. So these are really tools of a given language. And here are examples of how we can create new uh, words by using uh, morphology. So by adding grammatical morphemes and uh, one of uh, the ways of uh, adding the form of words is inflectional morphology. And every language has a different configuration. So in French, you have singular plural, male, female. And in German, you also have cases. And in Greek, in Russian, in Arabic, you have cases. And in, in Finnish, you have many, many cases, but you have no gender. And so this is a rather encyclopedic slide, but it should give you this um, intuition that all languages are equally complex, but the complexity is distributed in a different way. And this brings us to the use of finite state automata. So this we will talk more about it in the second part about uh, symbolic approaches. Uh, this is just a application of finite state automata to morphology to show that morphology is very regular and therefore we can model it using very nice tools, very elegant uh, mathematical tools. And uh, then um, some slides on Arabic. So um, I know you're not supposed to speak Arabic. 
I'm giving this as an example of a, a very nice language in the sense of morphology. So Arabic has a very nice morphological system, a very mathematical one. Since you have roots, these uh, you have ab about 5,000 roots, that's really a lot. And you can combine these roots with schemes. So here you have root phonemes uh, in red and scheme phonemes in black. And by combining them, you change forms. So this is morphology, but you stay in the same semantic domain. Now, of course, uh, you have infinite possibilities, but you don't use all of them. But you could actually, and uh, among all languages, Arabic is the, the one that is the most regular in its morphology. And this is worth saying. And of course, it has a lot of importance for processing Arabic text by computer. And then I uh, mentioned derivation by composition. So uh, in German or in Dutch or in, in Russian or in Greek, you have compound words and these have an in internal structure which software will have to analyze before processing any further. And this brings us to terminology. Now, terminology is a domain that uh, is a bit misunderstood. Why? Because for linguists, terminology has always been a sideway. Uh, something outside linguistics uh, dealt by people who were doing only terminology or lexicology, people uh, making uh, dictionaries. And so it was some kind of different religion than mainstream linguistics. Okay. For us, for doing text mining, Terminology is very important because it is the bridge between words and concepts. Between words and concepts, we often use complex terms. So if you are a lexicologist, a terminologist, then simple terms having a single word and complex terms are equally important. Okay, but we are not terminologists. We are computer scientists. And in computing, a simple term is just a word. So some words are more important than others. Okay, but uh, we don't need to go any further than that. But complex terms are very important because we should consider them as single entities. And this is an important step when uh, processing a corpus. So it means understanding what is a complex term. And I gave you the example of Telephone Rouge and Telephone Jaune. So this one connotes the a red telephone that is supposed to be uh, in um, connecting the Pentagon with uh, or the White House with the Kremlin. Well, this is probably a myth, but it's a known complex term. And uh, the sum of words contains more information than the individual words. So it's not just a telephone that happens to be read, it's a specific concept, which may be real, imaginary, no matter. While telephone jaune is just 
a yellow telephone. You can also take pièce jaune. In pièce verte is just a piece that is green. So a piece can be many things. It can be a room, it can be a work of music, it can be a coin, and it happens to be green. If I say pièce jaune, because this term has been used in the media for decades, I know that it's about coins that are collected for a given uh, reason, for a um, humanistic reasons and so on. Same thing with the uh, gilet jaune and so on. So these are complex terms and how do we identify them? This is the important question to ask for a computer scientist, for a data scientist. And uh, this paper in the 90s has given one possible answer, calculate something called termhood. So termhood is an indicator of how much a given complex term uh, sorry, a given pattern of words can be or not a complex term. So the probability, if you want, of this um, pattern of words of being a complex term. And they give an algorithm for calculating this. And in fact, and this you should know, because if you are going to use this algorithm, then you should know about its pitfalls, this algorithm will rank patterns in a given order. And it's up to you to decide the threshold be between patterns you will call terms and patterns you will not consider as terms. And of course, you can also go manually and inspect all but all candidates and decide which ones you keep it depends on the size of your corpus if you have a million terms then you cannot do it manually but it will give you a ranking and that's the whole idea of termhood now next important uh, notion the one of parts of of speech so now we are partly in linguistics, partly in um, symbolic methods. So you know uh, part of speech already from grammar. And here you have software that will assign these tags, part of speech, so POS, P-O-S, POS tags to words. Now software will assign them to words if you previously have done a terminological analysis, then maybe you have merged some words and then terms will get these post tags assigned, or maybe you have you do it the other way around and first assign part of speech tags to words, individual words, and then you combine this into a single entity with a single post tag. This is something we have seen in a lab. And once you have these part of speech, you can go to the next level. And the next level will be syntax. Now, uh, syntax considers the effect of order of words. And at the beginning of this class, there was a principle I mentioned, the principle of compositionality. And the principle of compositionality says, if I want the meaning of a sentence, the meaning of a complex structure, I will need the meaning of words. So the meaning of elements of my complex structure, plus the way I have combined these. So the order of words. So to get the meaning of the sentence, I need the meaning of individual words and 
the way I have combined them, the order I've given them. And syntax is interested in this part, in the order. Now, uh, we have dealt with two approaches to syntax. The one is by constituents. And the other one, much further, is by dependencies. We have seen also a third one, combinatorial categorical grammars. I doubt you will use this one. Uh, you can just keep somewhere in your mind the fact that they exist. But they are much uh, more seldomly used. What is used very frequently are dependency grammars and also constituents. What is important for you to keep in mind is the difference between the two approaches. The approach of constituents is the one where you have intermediate nodes. So you invent names for intermediate parts of your structure. You say, I have a sentence, and this sentence has sub-sentences, sub-groups. And in, in French, they are indeed called groups, group nominal, group verbal, and so on. In English, they are called phrases or syntagms. A syntagm is like a phoneme, syntagm. It's the elementary unit of syntax. Okay. Now, in constituents, you have this progressive decomposition. And taking the other way around, if you do this in a bottom to top approach, then you are combining things, moving up until you get to the top of your tree. And this is something we will see in the other part, in the part on symbolic methods, a way of accessing meaning of a sentence by going from the leaves of the tree, going up and combining things. OK. Uh, the constituents approach has been formalized by Chomsky, and this is why Chomsky invented formal grammars. And we will see this in the, the other thread. While dependency theory, invented by a Frenchman, Tenier, and in the 50s, uses a completely different approach. So here the approach is we don't take any additional nodes. Our only nodes are words. And we draw relations between these words, binary relations, which we call dependencies. In every relation, you have three things. You have the dependent, which is the source. You have the governor, which is the target. And you have the nature of the dependency, the nature of the relation. And this is done in such a way that you get a rooted tree. A rooted tree is a tree where you have paths with a given direction and you can either go from all leaves to the root or inversely from the root to all leaves so once you have this you call this a rooted tree and here the root is called the head of the sentence and it's mostly the verb And here is how we draw this. You see, you have arrows and you have the natures of dependencies. And you have very nice tools for calculating dependencies, dependency parsers. 
and dependencies are really the tendency at the moment, more than constitutes. Now, uh, the most important question is where will we use dependencies? Where will we use constituents? And also another question is, can we go from one format to the other? Uh, constituents are better suited for uh, tasks where you need to know every detail of your structure. For example, automatic translation. When you translate, you may need every part of the structure of your sentence to build a sentence in the target language. Now, of course, this is not the only way of doing automatic translation. You can also do it through neuronal networks. But even in that case, like we have seen with attention mechanisms, even in that case, sometimes you need access to parts of your structure. But in the traditional, in the legacy way of doing automatic translation, you will use rather constituents because you get these, the structure in one language, which you can transform in a structure in the other language. Dependencies are rather used in tasks where we just need to find some elements in a sentence. So for example, in uh, emotion mining, sentiment mining. You want to um, make statistics on the sentiment of users for a given product. Doing dependency passing, you will get trees. In, this, in these trees, you will find the named entity of your product. And then you can consider different parts. So how is this named entity connected to the head of the tree? So 90% of the time, it will be a verb. So what verb is it? Is it a positive verb, a negative verb? Uh, is it good, is it bad? Then if the product you're looking for is the subject of the verb, then you will look at potential objects, direct object, indirect object. If it's the object, then you will look at the subject. So who is saying so? And then the dependency tree will allow you to easily detect negation. If you know the negation mechanisms in a given language, so for example, in French, it's uh, ne pas, or just ne, or just pas. So just ne in very formal speech, just pas in informal everyday speech. Your dependency tree will connect this ne and this pas to the verb. So you just look at the neighborhood of the verb, and if you see negation particles, then you know it's a negation. So it's always very simple. Okay. Now, uh, it's maybe time for a break. So after the break, we will talk about uh, semantics and also symbolic methods. Uh, symbolic methods will be a bit faster, so uh, it's uh, because uh, there are many technical issues that um, uh, will not take a lot to explain. And uh, finally, we will speak about uh, machine learning. So it's 10.48. Let us continue at uh, 11. Okay, see you in a moment.
Now, about uh, semantics. So this is an important field be because as data scientists, this is where you have, you will have the most uh, to contribute because um, the approaches to semantics can be quite different and most people don't have a clear idea about how it works and what uh, the different approaches imply. So as a data scientist, you will have uh, the possibility to clarify things, to guide others and to uh, provide different viewpoints uh, to semantics. And this is all, always, I have um, noticed this by my own experience, it's always very helpful in companies to have a clear idea about how semantics function and uh, what are the, uh, their limits and what are their uh, possibilities. So this is why I have given uh, several approaches and uh, for most of them you just need to know that they exist and uh, where they can be applied. So for example, this is very introductive, the different kinds of nimis, hyponymies, synonymies, and so on. This is important and used in many different approaches. And the first complete approach, formal concept analysis, is a very square approach. I'm div dividing properties into individuals and I take individuals having given properties which are called features and then I'm looking at features and uh, considering individuals that have these features and so on so I have this table between individuals the individual concepts and features and I get this binary table and building on this, I can have a complete theory and I can define what a concept is, what a context is, extension, intention. Now, this theory is not uh, very widespread in text mining because uh, it's very rigorous and therefore uh, doesn't suffer ambiguity very well. It can be used in specific, specific domains where everything is well defined and where um, you can go in depth in analyzing uh, sentences uh, where you know exactly what each uh, concept is and uh, so what are the concepts, what are the features? Okay, but uh, these terms of extension and intention with an S have been used generally in many approaches. And it's good to know that this uh, approach exists, formal concept analysis. Then we have approached approaches based on tools. So WhatNet is a tool, it's a resource. And it's a very specific resource because it has this interesting concept of synsets. A synset is a set of synonyms. And together, these synonyms identify, represent a given concept. So the idea is that instead of describing the concept in an intentional way, I give terms that have a common meaning and I'm letting the human find, discover the common meaning of these terms. Okay, so uh, 
is what not useful it's useful for many tasks because it's what we call a golden corpus so it has been manufactured manually by linguists during decades so it's a very rigorous resource but it has also its limits so many people use it but sometimes not um, very efficiently so you should uh, if you need it you should take a closer look also at its uh, limits and uh, its strength. FrameNet is a different resource that uses frames. So a frame is a domain in which words are unambiguous. Okay, we don't have a lot of time. Then I have some slides on Montague formal semantics. Now here, what is interesting is that the same method of formal semantics is used also in compilers. So this is not just for natural language, it's also for control language, formal languages, programming languages, always the same approach. And the approach is going bottom up taking the meaning of individual leaves going up and whenever you have a join of two uh, vertices in your graph you combine them by some method and this method here is composition uh, sorry it's uh, application so you apply the left part to the right part and for this, we have introduced Lambda Calculus. So some of you may knew it already. Some others may have discovered it. It's just a formalism that is heavily used in computer science in theoretical computer science. And that has been used heavily by Montague and uh, people following Montague, but it's a bit less used today. And the whole approach of Montague formal semantics works very well for formal languages, but uh, is a bit too heavy for natural languages. So this doesn't mean you it, it's worthless. It only depends on the type of language you are dealing with. So if you can control the level of correctness, the level of rigor of your language, then, and if you can guarantee a certain level of syntactic correctness and semantic unambiguity, then Montague formal semantics can be applied in a very efficient way. If you cannot guarantee this, then you will have many dropouts and many failures. So if we take a continuum of methods between, on the one side, machine learning, neural networks, everything is learned, you are training a network. And on the other hand, symbolic methods where uh, everything relies on precise logic montague formal semantics are the extreme on this side on the symbolic side now discourse semantics what you need to keep in mind is that when you have a text sentences interact in a non-trivial way and finding out how they interact and how they share pieces of information is covered by discourse semantics. And in some cases, you need it. So even a chatbot may need to refer to previous sentences have, having been uttered by the chatbot or by the human. And whenever the discussion is 
continuing. Your chatbot may need to find the discursive relations between sentences. And here are the different techniques that exist to do this. Pragmatics is another layer. What you should keep in mind is what is uh, covered by pragmatics. So pragmatics means taking a sentence and putting it in context. So who is uttering the sentence at what moment for what reason and who is he addressing? And this can uh, have effects on all other levels. So depending on the context in which I'm saying something or writing something, the meaning can be different. Syntax can be different, morphology can be different, everything can be different. Okay, now most of the time, uh, pragma, the pragmatic layer does not have tremendous effects. But for a chatbot, it can be useful and it can be a good extra to know, to have some knowledge of the context and to use what we call implicatures, which are inferences done implicitly. And if you are interacting with uh, clients, so if you have a chatbot that will interact with clients, then you may have to implement some of these implications. Now, don't worry, it's not something you will uh, have to think before even using the chatbot. Most of the time what happens is you are building a chatbot, it starts working and then at some time during the testing phase or during the uh, during the working phase, you realize that there are some misunderstandings. And what your contribution will be is to take these misunderstandings, to analyze them as failures on the pragmatic level and to implement implicatures, to add some inferences that when a client says this, in this context, in the current context of COVID or in the context of um, uh, a Frenchman or uh, an American or so on. In fact, the client means this and we should add this additional information. That's all. Uh, in pragmatics, we also deal with the agreement, the silent agreement between speakers or communicate uh, people that communicate and this has been formalized by Grice in his Maxims. So this is interesting to keep in mind when building a chatbot. Uh, among implicatures, you have uh, the knowledge of metaphors and metaphors are being gathered and the resources are being built. And uh, finally, at the end of this uh, thread, I'm mentioning controlled language, control languages because they are an intermediate between natural and formal languages. And sometimes for some tasks, you may need controlled languages. And in that case, you have to do two things. First of all, to establish a protocol. So how will the human use the controlled language? Will he or she have to learn the rules or will I correct the rules and have the human repeat statements and then how you will deal with this control language. So will it be rigorous enough to apply Montague formal semantics or whatever. So you should know this exists, that there are resources on that, that there are people working on them and that maybe there could be a solution to your problem.
Okay, so we don't have time to, um, uh, argumentation and speech act. So consider this as being rather encyclopedic and useful. And uh, this book is actually quite violent, but it's also quite uh, unexpected and uh, interesting. So let me move to uh, symbolic methods. So some of them we have already mentioned. Uh, structuralism means that any domain can be considered in this way by finding elementary units and considering them in a paradigmatic way. So what happens when I replace my, my units by other units? And in a syntagmatic way, how are they structured? Is there an order? And what happens when I change the order? So it's as simple as that. And you can apply it practically to any domain of knowledge. Formal languages. Some of you already knew this uh, because it's taught in uh, computer science, in elementary computer science. It's mathematics, a special kind of mathematics, where we have a set called an alphabet, an operator of concatenation, which is neither commutative, not associative or anything. And uh, by taking instances of the members of our alphabet and using this operator, we build words. So this is the main idea. And then the whole difficulty is to describe a language by saying how you decide whether a given word belongs or not to the language. So if it's a finite language, you can give all words if it's not too big. And if it's an infinite language, then you need some other method. And we call sets of formal words, formal languages. There are many types of them. Chomsky has given a hierarchy. And in natural language processing, we deal mostly with regular and context-free languages. And Chomsky has given a way of describing arbitrary formal languages, but by what he calls production rules. Depending on the kind of production rules, you can assign a type to your language from very general to very specific. And by applying production rules, you start with intermediate symbols. So this is like a constituent syntax. We have additional symbols that are used only in the rules. And our alphabet is the alphabet of terminal symbols that are used to create words. So your language has only words, has only terminal symbols, but you use intermediate symbols in your rules. And whenever you can apply rules and end up with a word, then this word belongs to your language. And we call this sequence of application of production rules a derivation. Okay, and then we saw uh, the simplest kind of languages called regular languages and three tools for uh, describing them, namely finite state automata, regular expressions, and of course, formal grammars. Then we saw context-free languages, which are a bit more complex than regular languages and we have 
not the equivalent of regular expressions, but we have the equivalent of finite state automata. They are called push down automata. And then we even saw an example of a context uh, aware language, which we have described by a formal grammar. Okay, so the following slides are about formal languages, how to describe them. Regular expressions are a tool, a very important tool for data scientists. Finite state automata are also an important tool, but most of the time you don't use them directly you write regular expressions and the machine converts regular expressions into finite state automata. And a finite state automaton is a very straightforward way for the machine to uh, verify if a word belongs to a given formal language or not. So of course you have to know the formalism of finite state automata, you have to uh, be able to create such uh, finite state automata. Uh, but there are tools for doing it, and we have seen uh, Python implementations in, in labs. And uh, one thing really to remember is that uh, however complex the graphical representation of a finite state automaton may look like, in fact, an automaton is just a table. A table plus uh, information about initial states and final states, and that's all. And the computer will follow this table, and uh, when ending up on a final state, will conclude that the word belongs to the language and otherwise it doesn't belong. And here I have an example of a push down automaton for one language which is a bit emblematic because it's a very simple language for a human. Just take n times the first symbol and then n times the second symbol, but impossible to process by finite state automata. You need an infinite amount of states. And this can be dealt with with stacks. And push down meaning pushing something on the stack and then uh, pulling it from the stack. Then we talked about syntax trees. We gave examples. I hope that these were motivating enough. And um, And here I have an example of a context sensitive language. So this is just encyclopedic knowledge, but it, it shows how difficult it is to define something as simple as just copying. So here, the language we are describing is a language where words are always of even length. And the first half is identical to the second half. So again, it's emblematic because it's very simply to describe for a human in human terms, but uh, it's quite complex for the machine. And this is just um, a parenthesis, which can be important for you if someday you need this kind of grammar uh, these are called visual grammars, and the, their purpose is to describe diagrams. So diagrams are very important in communication. There are many people working on diagrams, on analyzing diagrams, producing diagrams, uh, formalizing diagrams, and so on. And they may become even more important in future uh, human-machine interfaces. 
So how do we describe a diagram? We break it down into pieces, so elementary units. So here these elementary units are words in an alphabet. And then we combine the elements, but here combining them is not just concatenating them like in a usual word. Here we have many concatenation operators. And this is the main difference between visual grammars and standard grammars. Now, we move one step further from formal languages to formal systems. A formal system is a formal language plus a deductive system. Now, uh, I forgot one thing. It's a formal language and words of this language are called well-formed statements. And the deductive, the deductive system is, first of all, a set of well-formed statements, so a set of words of this formal language that we call axioms. And then, and this is the most important, a way of getting new words, new well-formed statements out of existing ones. And this is called inference. So inference is a word, I don't know if you have discovered this word in this uh, course or not, but it's a very important word in artificial intelligence and in computer science in general. Inference can be, uh, inference is part of logic, as we will see, but inference is also part of probability theory, where you have probabilistic inference. And in general, what science does is taking the current state of things, doing an experiment, and from the current state and the new data obtained from the experiment, infer a new state of things. So inference is very important. It's a very important notion. And formal systems are important because you start with a finite and sometimes a very small set of words. And through inference, you get a potentially infinite number of new words. Inference rules are written in this way using this symbol. So this symbol means deduction. I'm deducing G from F1 to Fn using inference rule R. And a proof means, theoretically, it means starting from axioms, applying inference rules until getting to the result we want to prove. Of course, if you are taking mathematics, then the axioms are light years away from what you want to prove. So you are using other theory, other uh, proofs that they themselves use other proofs and so on. And these intermediate statements are called theorems. And what you prove, once you have proven it, is also a theorem. Okay, then we move to first order logic. So uh, as we will see, first order logic is not the only kind of logic, but uh, for historical reasons, it's the most fundamental one. It is a formal system. So you have a formal language with specific kinds of um, ingredients and an inference system, which we will see, that allows to obtain new words. So words here are called formulas or statements in French, enoncé, enoncé logique, uh, 
you can obtain from existing ones or from axioms. Here I'm giving an example of two inference methods called modus ponens and not poppens, sorry, and modus tollens. So modus ponens is if for all x, px implies qx. And if I have p of a, then modus ponens says I have q of a. And modus tollens says, again, if for all x, p of x implies q of x, and I do not have q of some constant b, then I do not have p of this constant b. This is a very important slide because it gives the terminology I use and the terminology that is uh, relevant in artificial intelligence. So in other sciences, in other domains, terminology may be slightly different. Here we use this terminology, what is data, what is information, what is knowledge? And information is data with meaning. So when I give you a number, you know what this number represents. And knowledge is connected to prediction. So if I can predict something, then it means I know the mechanism that will make it occur. And this mechanism is knowledge, not just data. So if you think about it, this has, uh, is reflected in logic. In logic, uh, you use characters to write formulas, that is data. Your formulas have ingredients that have individual meaning. This is information. And when you do inference, you get new formulas. So you predict in some sense. If, you, if we take the proof of something as a temporal process, then you predict. And this is knowledge. Now, another important notion, and uh, it's a technical notion. So um, you shouldn't consider it as something philosophically profound or anything. It's a technical notion. It's the notion of interpretation. So interpretation means I take a formula and I map it into some situation. Mapping has a very technical meaning. It's sending each constant of my formula to an individual in my domain. So defining a domain, then mapping constants, mapping uh, predicates, mapping functions in a specific way, which is explained uh, somewhere here, here. Voila, and on this slide, exactly what is interpretation. So this is technical. It's related to first order logic and all other logics. It's related to artificial intelligence. When you do it, you should do it rigorously. And what happens when we interpret uh, formula is that in this interpretation, the formula may be true or false. So the big advantage of interpretation is that you get the notion of truth. A formula, when you just write it, uh, there is, you can't even ask the question whether it's false or true because you don't know what it means. Once you map it to some situation by interpretation, then it may be true or false. And of course, if it has variables, then its truth value may depend on the values of its variables. Okay. Now, uh, 
I gave the example of this uh, robot, which looks like a Dalek, but it's not a Dalek, so it's not evil at all. And uh, the idea is that logic can be used as a decision pro uh, process of the robot. So the robot gets input from the outside world and has to decide what the next action will be. And this can be done through uh, logic formulas. Can also be done probabilistically. So today, such a robot will probably have a neuronal network to take decisions. And at that early stage in the 70s, uh, it would be a logical approach. So here I'm giving examples of interpretation. Uh, why am I insisting so much on interpretation? Because it's uh, a bit subtle. And I think it's part of uh, the stuff you will have more difficulties in understanding by your own rather than being taught. So that's my impression. So maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I think that interpretation and model theory uh, has to be understood. And it's like we often have in mathematics, it's a, it's a threshold. Once you have understood it, everything becomes clear. Before you understand it, things seem obscure and decorrelated. So you should uh, try through these slides to understand the idea of interpretation and model theory, and I hope it works. And this slide is somehow a test to see whether you have grasped the meaning of interpretation and models. So it is absolutely useless as a slide uh, for your career, for science in general, but it allows you to Maybe like in, in Zen where you have this um, sudden shock which causes the Satori, maybe this will allow you to realize whether you've understood or not. So let me spend a few seconds on it, even though it's useless. So uh, tautology is a formula that is true in all interpretations. Okay, so this means that you take this formula you interpret it in any possible and imaginable way. And it's always true. Okay. Now, question. Is the formula there exists an X such that X equals mind dimension? Is this a tautology? So your first reaction should be, depending on the interpretation, this can also be false. When I say there is a, there exists an X such that X is a mind dimension, well, I, it, it suffices to take a domain in which there are no mind dimensions. And in that case, my formula will be false. Well, no. And the fact is that interpretation is something rigorous. It has rules. And one of the rules is that when you interpret a formula for each constant of this formula, you have to define an individual in your domain. You have to assign this individual to each constant. It may be the same individual for a constant, that doesn't matter. You may have only one individual in your whole domain, that doesn't matter. What matters is that each constant you need to assign it, each constant has to be assigned to some individual. Otherwise, you don't have an interpretation. So this is to understand that interpreting is not like in everyday life where we all know what interpretation means and uh, musicians interpret and we interpret and uh, commentators on TV interpret and so on. No, this is a specific technical operation 
called interpretation and it has rules. And one of the rules is for each constant, you need an individual. Okay, once you have taken individual for mind dimension, automatically, it means that in your domain, you have a mind dimension. And therefore, the formula is true. Okay, so I hope it is clear and I hope it shows you that interpretation is a specific operation with specific rules. Uh, propositional logic is a special case, an easier case of first order logic, and it has the advantage of using truth tables something unimaginable in first order logic. So this means that your interpretation is nothing complex, nothing imaginative. Your interpretation is always just a set of values, true or false, for your propositions. Consequence is a relation between formulas that seemingly depends on interpretation, but it's defined in such a way that it should work for any interpretation. So we say that beta is a consequence of alpha if every model of alpha is a model of beta. So no matter what interpretation you take for both alpha and beta, Whenever alpha is true, beta is also true. Consequence is important because that's what we look for when uh, we do uh, queries. So, for example, when I uh, I'm stating a hypothesis. So is it true that the current president is Joe Biden? Hypothesis. I go to Wikipedia. If I consider that Wikipedia is a model, a true corpus, no, not Wikipedia, sorry, Wikipedia I can consider Wikipedia as a set of logical formulas, or DBpedia. And if I consider that the real world is a model of Wikipedia, in the sense that if I interpret Wikipedia in the real world, then all formulas are true in Wikipedia, then I would like to know whether my query is Joe Biden president is a consequence of Wikipedia. If it's a consequence, and I know that Wikipedia is true in the real world, then my hypothesis is true as well. So the notion of consequence is very important in artificial intelligence. And that's what we're looking at uh, when we ask questions. Asking a question, how is the weather today, is a question of something being a consequence uh, in the uh, interpretation of uh, the real world. No, sorry, no. Um, the weather has to do with the uh, specific interpretation and um, the question of um, Joe Biden being a president is a consequence of Wikipedia. And Wikipedia, if I consider Wikipedia as being true in the real world, then I'm looking at uh, whether Joe Biden is a president is a consequence of it or not. And in general, science looks at consequences with respect to pre-existing knowledge. Voilà.
Then I have some examples of formalization of natural language into logic. And this is what you obtain uh, when you do Montague semantics. Uh, satisfiability, so is can a formula be true in some interpretation or not? And finally, what is a knowledge base? A knowledge base is just a conjunction of formulas such that it is true in a given interpretation that is interesting. So for example, the real world or maybe some other one. I can build a knowledge base on uh, um, the Lord of the Rings. In that case, it will be true in the interpretation of the Lord of the Rings. Voila. Now, these are technical uh, stuff. Uh, it's about how to do calculation with formulas. And once you do calculations, you add the types, you consider in your domain, the different individuals of being of various types, and uh, then predicates and functions be become the, the same thing with just different output types, Boolean for predicates and domain dependent for functions. So we did a lab on a automatic uh, theorem prover in type logic. And this is something you can use for your software. And uh, finally, we had some slides about uh, playing around with inference rules. So this is just for encyclopedic knowledge, the fact that um, modus ponens, modus tollens are important, but we can always imagine other rules and obtain uh, weird results. Okay, then uh, again, uh, encyclopedic slides, but that may prove being useful for you are extensions of first order logic called model logics. So, uh, for example, if you are building a system that has to decide whether something is allowed or forbidden, possible or impossible, then you may need this kind of logic called alethic logic uh, with operators for necessary and possible. Now, of course, it's easy to add operators. The important part is what happens to your axioms and your inferences. And anyone can add these two operators but then you have to think about how they interact. And this depends on the meaning of your operators. So all of the importance of alethic logic is here because through these operations, you can do calculations. Similarly, for a different kind of logic called epistemic logic, who knows what? And as I told you, this is important in cybersecurity. And it has specific inference rules and specific actions. And then there is another one for which I had no slide, and which is deontic logic. Uh, deontic logic is about what is allowed, what is forbidden. And it's used in legal systems systems that will decide whether a given operation is legal or illegal. So legal or illegal means conforming to a legal system, a system of laws that have been formalized. 
Now, this is very difficult to do for human law, for uh, criminal law and uh, matrimonial law and so on. But it has been done and it's used all the time for uh, automatic operations, either in finance or in electronic commerce. Okay. Now, the next part of this uh, uh, thread is about the semantic web technologies. So I'm giving a quite long introduction to the different levels of the semantic cake. So this is important because these technologies are widespread in industry. So it's very probable that in your professional life, you will have to deal with these kinds of tools. What you need to understand is how they are structured, the different layers, and how you can combine them to model some situation. So for example, the lowest level, level is uh, Unicode and ERIs. What you should keep in mind is that ERIs are as fundamental as characters in Unicode. So when I write this uh, ERI here, for example, this, uh, and I open the page by mistake. So when I write this, it's an elementary unit like a single character. Now, of course, you may object that this contains character. Okay. The written representation of it contains characters, but seeing from an abstract point of view, it's an elementary unit by its own. Okay, so this is what you should keep in mind. Uh, XML gives structure to uh, provide structure to data, only structure, not semantics, only structure. And then for semantics, we use triples. And this is again, something very elementary. It's a choice, the choice of using these very simplistic um, pieces of information, subject, predicate, object, where each one of the three is an ERI. And then once we define these triples, and don't forget, whenever you are doing semantic web technologies, you always need to give your context, your namespace. Okay? And then we go beyond and we give more structure. So RDFS has more structure, more features than RDF, and ontologies go beyond. And then you have Sparkle as a query language for triples. And you have ontologies that combine triples in a graph structure and have many more ingredients. And then on the web, you have thousands of ontologies you can use. Now, how do we use ontologies? We did a lab on this. The idea is that ontologies contain concepts and relations. And this is very easy to visualize. You have a graph where concepts are nodes and relations are vertices. Uh, sorry, edges. So. Uh, concepts are vertices and relations are edges. Okay. And in this initiative, the idea is that 
all of these ontologies communicate. And whenever a concept is provided already in some other ontology, there is a link. So this is a way to model the entire human knowledge. Some ontologies are on a very high level and they have very philosophical concepts like time, space, uh, existence, and things like that. And others are a bit lower. So they use higher concepts and define their own concepts in given domains. And then you can get more and more specialized ontologies on specific domains. And if the work is well done, then all of these have to communicate. Now, of course, they are human artifacts, so they are not perfect. And they are far from being perfect because every ontology has been created by some community of users. And this community of users has a given domain and doesn't necessarily know other domains. So uh, what may happen here is that a given ontology may be quite accurate about a given domain, but may fail to communicate very well with other ontologies. Okay. So we, as we would say in machine learning, we will have a lot of precision, but not a lot of recall. Okay. But that's the way it is. And uh, it may improve in the future because uh, ontologies are not uh, Fijé are not uh, fixed, they can evolve. So what you should uh, know is that they exist and that you may have to use them. Now, in what context? Well, for example, uh, what happens often is that a company wants to formalize and keep what is called its inheritance, the patrimoine. So the inheritance of a company is, of course, data, information, names of clients, name of products, uh, recipes of products, uh, but also processes. How does the company work? Uh, what, how is the quality of the company organized? And all of these. So the whole philosophy, the whole way of doing of a company is what is called its heritage. And this can be modeled through ontologies. And you may very well be asked to do something in this uh, area. And I think I've shown you also some examples of either PhD positions or uh, master internships where this is requested. So there is a corpus. And when I say a corpus, that necessarily only text, it can be any kind of knowledge domain. And an engineer, a data scientist is asked to model it, to formalize it. And for that, the best approach is to use ontologies. Now, ontologies are not the only approach. You more also have uh, knowledge graphs, uh, conceptual graphs. This is a French invention. It also uses a graph with concepts as um, vertices, but it's a bipartite graph in which you also have vertices for relations. And by doing this, we can have relations with higher arity than just binary relations. So some knowledge domains may be easier to describe using conceptual graphs. Now, of course, the problem is that industry has adopted ontologies and not necessarily widely uh, conceptual graphs. 
So uh, maybe someday there will be uh, more usage of conceptual graphs, but for the moment, ontologies are the tenet. Now, in the semantic web cake, ontologies are described by a standard called OL. OL, which means web ontology language. This standard is based on a special kind of logics, plural logics, called description logics. And I gave you some slides and we did a lab on description logics. And here, what you should keep in mind is the different ways of representing what happens in an ontology. So this is all in XML, and these are logical formulas in description logics representing the same uh, features of your ontology. And a third representation is through this software called Protégé, where you can display all this on a uh, graphical uh, user interface. And we did a lab, it was one of the most important labs, where you could manage, query, and even create ontologies through Python. Okay, so let's move on. And we had some exercises on de description logics and why they are called logics in the plural because they have ingredients. And when you select ingredients, you get different kinds of logic. So you can voluntarily say, I don't want some of the ingredients and I will get a simpler formalism and this will be easier to process. Voila, and this ends the part on symbolic approaches. So in symbolic approaches, we saw the mathematical tools used in natural language processing, at least in the symbolic approach, formal languages, different kinds of logic, and the semantic web cake. Now the, the third thread, the one that was a bit underrepresented was the one on machine learning. Now, why was it underrepresented? Uh, because Uh, I could have give you a course on different technologies used in the lay in the um, uh, in the last uh, thirty years, like um, Markov processes, conditional random fields, uh, support vector machines, decision trees. Okay. The fact is that these methods are not used anymore, or at least are not trends today. So uh, it would be aesthetically nice to give you information on these, but not very useful for you. Today, what is predominant in machine learning approaches of text mining are natural uh, neural networks. Now, I could give you a list of neural networks, and uh, but then I again couldn't go into depth because this would mean many technical details, which are maybe not very useful. And what I also could have done is to give you a catalog of applications of neural networks and this could would be a very long catalog because in the last uh, 10 years there have been extremely many developments uh, what to do 
I have chosen an intermediate uh, road. Uh, of course, I talked about neural networks. For the simplest case, I have chosen to give you the mathematical details so that you are able to read a paper on neural networks and understand the notation. And then for other tasks, I have chosen to give you just examples without going into depth. Just examples and the main ideas on how they function. And uh, this, of course, produced less slides and uh, many technicalities. And it's, um, I think it's uh, connected, it's related to the uh, nature of uh, this kind of information. So this thread is subdivided in tasks. We have text classification, topic modeling, and automatic summarization. For text classification, I immediately start with neural networks. I don't even enter into the history of text classification, which is very long. And uh, almost all possible in technologies have been used. I start with uh, the theory of neural networks, the notation, the tools, naive base, maximum likelihood estimation, loss function, and how to combine these tools into neural networks. And then to make this more concrete, I gave you also the code in Python. And given these theoretical insights on, on the math allows us to better understand the parameters in Python implementation. So this is uh, looking at the math is useful for two reasons. The one, the first one is to be able to read research papers on neural networks. And the other one is to understand parameters. And the, the first one was about text classification. And I used two examples, naive base and logistic regression. They have different philosophies, but the same tools are used if I call the loss function uh, a tool, if I call gradient descent a tool. And here, uh, here's some terminology, and again, Python implementation and meanings of the parameters. Now, uh, first special kind of neural networks are feed formal neural networks, so neural networks with more than one layers, but this is the simplest case of multi-layer neural networks, those that feed forward. And the mathematics are quite simple. We take the tools we have seen, and mainly logistic regression, and we apply them to each layer. So when you see this notation that uh, at first sight looks a bit cryptic, it simply means that this is the parameter we have already seen in logistic regression applied to the layer that goes from X to Z. And we apply logistic regression to each layer. And a softmax at the end, the softmax is just to return into the probability setting where we have different values that sum up to be equal to one. And we see the math of combining them. And we see what it means to apply 
loss function and gradient descent. And applying the gradient, gradient descent is doing some operations that depend on both layers. This is the first layer, this is the second layer. And this is the bias, so the additional information we include. And these are the calculations done to train the network. So uh, most of you have followed a class on neural networks. So this is not new to you. Maybe the notation is new because there are many notations, but um, maybe this is, you know, all of this already. But for the sake of completeness, uh, here's the idea. You go through different layers, you arrive at the output and there during the training step, you confront what you got with the values you want to obtain, you take the difference and you back propagate this difference and you train your neurons with respect to this difference to make the difference smaller. How much smaller this depends on the learning rate, which is this eta parameter here. And then you start once again going forward and backward. You do this for many individuals at the same time. This is called a batch. And you can monitor the uh, performance of your network by looking at, for example, accuracy. And then you have accuracy during training, which necessarily becomes higher and higher, but also accuracy of validation on a testing corpus, and then you can see the difference between the two. And you can calculate accuracy or loss. And this is just the loss function. So this is not specific to text, it's what you get in any uh, neural network. Now, it becomes a bit more specific to text when we delve into distributional semantics. So, um, distributional semantics is another way of viewing semantics, which is to consider a probabilistic setting in which the meaning of each word depends on the meaning of the surrounding words. So, of course, this is not a complete theory. This is not the ultimate answer to the question, what is meaning? It is just a computational tool. It's just a tool to allow us to calculate semantics. So, if we want semantics in double quotes. But it's a tool that is working quite well. And here, the basic idea is the one of language model. So a language model is a probability distribution, not only on words, but on word sequences. So here, um, contrarily to something we saw in a lab, which is the back of words, the fact of counting words and forgetting about the order. Here, the order is taken into account. But taking the order into account doesn't mean that we are doing uh, syntactic analysis. We are not looking at the constituents or the dependencies or things like that. We just take the words in order inside a sentence or even between sentences. And we work with that. And a, se a sequence of words of a given length is called an engram. 
So we start working on conditional probability in n grams. And we introduce the notion of embedding. So this is a very important notion in uh, machine learning uh, text mining. It's the fact of taking a vocabulary that can be huge. It can be huge because you will not necessarily start by lemmatizing your text you may take your text as it is. So some words will be in plural, some in singular, some verbs will be conjugate, some will be in infinitive, some words will be misspelled, some words will be named entities, some words will be interjections, it doesn't matter. You take everything <clears throat> as it is. Now, doing this means you have a very large vocabulary. You cannot do calculations on this because uh, if you look at n grams, the probability of having a sequence can be very small. And uh, you may also have many forms of the same word. So this will be noise in your calculations and so on. So one way of dealing with such a huge vocabulary is to build an embedding. An embedding is taking this vocabulary as and considering each element of the vocabulary as a point in space. In a space, in an Euclidean space of high dimension. So high, not as high as the vocabulary, vocabulary may have 10,000 entries. This Euclidean space will have only 300, but still higher than the plane and uh, three-dimensional space. And since it's a Euclidean space, you have measures of distance. And in a good embedding, these distances correspond to semantic similarity, more or less in a statistical way, and directions in this space correspond to linguistic phenomena, linguistic transformations. For example, going from male to female, going from singular to plural, from uh, uh, the simple to superlative and so on. Now, to produce embeddings, you can have this approach, which is called continuous back of words, which has the particularity of taking an n-gram, except for the word in the middle. So taking the context of a word and taking the average of these vectors so forgetting about the order of the words, this is why it's called bag of words, and then training a network to detect this context. So when doing this continuously back and forth, you are building a relation between words and their contexts. You start with the context and you predict the words. Another approach is skip grams, where you do the contrary. So you start with a word and you predict context. These contexts have an order. Okay, so this is not a bag of words approach. Here, your contexts have a given order. But otherwise, it's quite symmetric. Uh, I also mentioned GLOVE, so GLOVE is another approach for building embeddings, which is not based on neural networks, but these embeddings can be used in neural networks. And sometimes they have better results than uh, neural networks. 
and uh, from this I switch to another task which was uh, just a moment which was topic modeling so this is an important task because topics are some kind of unsupervised classification of your documents. So uh, you have a document and you want to classify it in an unsupervised way. So you don't know in advance uh, what the classes are. Topic modeling will give you a predefined number of topics and the probability distribution of these topics for each document. Now, the topic modeling is also a trend today. As data scientists, you have to really understand exactly what topics are and what they are not. So it's not a miracle solution. You can ask a given number of topics. You will get a probability distribution, but it doesn't mean that these topics will be useful. So I'm giving a method, a first method, Latin semantic analysis, and then another method, Latin directly allocation, to obtain topics with all the math details. And uh, most importantly, I give you examples from a given corpus. I give you uh, for a choice of 10 different topics, the most representative words of these topics. Now, once this is done, this is done by machine. The data scientist has to go look at these topics and decide whether or not they make sense, whether or not they are coherent. Now, of course, this is not only by looking at the 10 most important words. Uh, uh, one should go more in depth, but this gives already a first idea on the pertinence of the topics. And so, for example, here, as we have seen, you have a topic on government plan, water, Sydney, farmer, boost, power, union. So this obviously is a topic about politics. And here you have hospital health, government fear, news. This is probably a topic about the sanitary situation. So these are hypotheses. The data scientist has to emit these hypotheses and validate them. And sometimes the whole process of topic modeling has to be done several times with different parameters until one obtains a, a adequate set of topics. So it's really a trial and error uh, approach. And when it works, it's fine, but very often it doesn't work. So be prepared to have many topics uh, that uh, make no sense. Uh, I also gave you a tool for called coherence for evaluating the quality of topics. Where is it? Uh, there should be a slide on coherence. Here it is. Now, this is not the only tool and it's, again, it's not the universal truth but at least it gives you some means of comparing different sets of topics and the distributions. The next task 
uh, was automatic summarization. This was also the last example I gave. And in this case, I have given some historical background to show you the complexity of the issue and the historical uh, evolution of uh, the different approaches. So here you can recognize the methods of the 60s. We want to understand something thoroughly, analyzing it, analyze it and make a real good summary, which of course is impossible because we are unable to understand things as clearly as implicitly uh, mentioned here. Second approach in the 80s, we will cheat. We will just extract some sentences. It's easy to extract sentences, but still you have to choose the sentences you will extract. And for that, there are many ideas. Third approach in the 90s, learning. So if we have a corpus of examples, then we can train a uh, uh, machine learning algorithm to do the same thing, to extract uh, uh, sentences uh, by looking at examples. And finally, you see, this is not an error. It's a six over five. This is what happens today using deep learning. And here you encounter another kind of neural networks, which you have probably already seen in other domains, such as image recognition and so on, which uses a mechanism, an internal mechanism called attention. And this already is important. This is long, short range uh, uh, memory. And uh, this is already an important kind of neural networks and it becomes even more important when we add the attention mechanism. And this attention mechanism somehow reestablishes the um, importance of the structure of sentences, the syntax. So as you can see here, between English and French, the verb is not at the same position and the attention mechanism will map the verb to the verb. Without knowing what a verb is, without having any idea about uh, the constituents, the de syntactic dependencies and so on, but just by training, the attention mechanism will find these relations between positions and will use it. So it's very important and it produces very nice results. And here, we have seen the results. So uh, it's time to stop this uh, review.